you know, the, the songs that, that stick out for me are the ones that I'm still performing live in concert. We're on tour right now, as a matter of fact. And there's a couple that um, that I, I, I don't want to say I, I enjoy more performing, um, but, <clears throat> you know, they do something. Like there's one song by Carol King and Jerry Goffin called Pleasant Valley Sunday. Yeah. Which, and then on this tour, we're doing some songs that we've never done before. One is uh, called Steam Engine, which you may, may not have seen, album cover. And another one called um, a Let's Dance On in the pilot episode. Um, and they just, uh, you know, they're all pretty, you know, when you have that kind of quality of material, it's hard, hard to screw it up. <laughs> but I do occasionally. Okay, I have a question. Um, when you all got together and decided, what are we going to name this band? Why did you pick the monkeys? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> that is uh, uh, that is a long story, but it's uh, uh, how do I explain this? The, uh, the monkeys was not a band; it was a television show. We were had never met each other until the first day of filming the TV show. It was the production company and the television company that named it the monkeys long before they cast us. So <clears throat> it is a great misconception that there was this band uh, before the television show. It's that, that's inaccurate. It was a TV show about an imaginary band that lived in this imaginary beach house in Malibu, which does beg the question of how we could afford a <laughs> Malibu beach house when we never got any work. <laughs> um, but if you go and Google it on, on Wikipedia or something, you, you'll get a better idea of what it was all about. Uh, hello, Mr. Nolan. My name is Michael Palmer from Outlaw Renegade Nation. And I wanted to hear you tell the story about meeting the Beatles uh, during their uh, recording of, I believe, Sgt. Pepper. Yep. And also, uh, two part, could you tell me who wrote Brady Scouse Cat and are you performing that on tour? Who wrote it? Yeah. Me. <laughs> That's all. Uh, well, I was fortunate enough to go over to England uh, in 67, I guess, on a press junket, and I met Paul first. And he had me to dinner at his house, and we hung out and just, you know, uh, for the evening. And he invited me to a recording session the next day for this <clears throat> album they were doing called Sergeant um, um, uh, Bilko. No, Sergeant... <laughs> Whatever happened to that album, it was good. <laughs> you just never know. No, so he invited... Well, I didn't know what the album was called at the time. I don't know if they did either, frankly. But <clears throat> I, um, I remember... Uh, getting dressed up and, and uh, you know, because I was expecting it to be some really incredible Beatlemania, fun fest, freak out, psycho jello kind of you know, <laughs> thing. <clears throat> and um, so I put on my paisley bell bottoms and my tie-dyed underwear and <laughs> I had the glasses on and the hair up and you know, I looked like a cross between <laughs> Ronald McDonald and Charlie Manson. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the limo picks me up uh, in the middle of the afternoon, it's right in the middle of the day, and drops me off at Abbey Road Studios. And I walk in and I'm like, Whoa, party, party! And there's nobody there except the four guys sitting in folding <laughs> chairs and jeans and t-shirts and just playing. Chunk, 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 chunk. And nobody's there. And I'm like, where are the girls? <laughs> <laughs> and John Lennon looks up at me and says, hey, monkey man. <laughs> That's what he called me, monkey man. Do you want to hear what we're, uh, what we're doing, what we're working on? And he points up to George Martin up in the booth, who's wearing a three-piece suit in the middle of the day. They had to. And he plays the tracks to Good Morning, Good Morning. And I, I remember that. And then we sat and had tea. The guy comes in at 4 o'clock. It's time for tea. And this <clears throat> studio guy comes in, and we sit around a little table and have tea at 4 o'clock. And um, 
and then they go back to work. And John says, all right, lads, back down the mines. And, and it was after that that I realized how they managed to produce that wealth of material in such a relatively short period of time, is that they had that Northern England, you know, working class mentality, and they just worked their butts off every day. You know, hours and hours and hours. And I believe, my understanding is, it was John that was kind of the slave driver, and he would be like, right lads, down the mines, you know, back to work. Oh. And that was it, and then, um, I uh, actually, uh, uh, not long after that, after Sgt. Pepper came out, I was direct, I'd written and directed an episode of The Monkees, and I said, you know, there's this scene at the beginning where we wake up in the, in the pad, and uh, I'd love to have that song by The Beatles, Good Morning, Good Morning, not knowing that they never, ever <coughs> gave any of their stuff away to, in those days, to TV or movies, nothing. And I don't remember how it happened. Somebody called somebody and got a hold of, of, of Paul or somebody at Apple and, and said, and Mickey wants to use the song in his show, and they gave me the song for the show. Wow. It's in that episode I, I wrote uh, and directed called uh, uh, The Frotoscape. <clears throat> and um, pretty unusual at the time. So the story about Randy Skowskin is that after all this experiences with the Beatles and four kings of EOI, obviously that was them, I just was noodling around one morning in the hotel after they'd thrown us a party. The Beatles had thrown us a party. <laughs> and again, I'm told I had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just noodling around and singing and, and writing sort of stream of consciousness stuff of people that were around me at the time and what I was doing at the time. And uh, I, I uh, was watching television and there was a show on called um, Till Death Us Do Part, uh, which became All in the Family over here. Uh, they bought the rights and, and redid it over here. <coughs> and there was a scene where the father was calling the young boy, his, his uh, son-in-law, a Randy Scouse kid. And I had no idea what it meant. <laughs> I just thought it sounded really funny. So I named the song Randy Scouse. And I get back to the States, and we record the song on the album. And <coughs> the uh, English publishers called, re the English record company, uh, got a, I have a letter they wrote, actually, <coughs> to this day. Um, and uh, they, they wrote this letter saying, you, if we want to release this in the UK as, as a single, uh, but you have to change the title because it's rude. And it's, it's not, it's, it's dir dirty. And I'm like, what? And <clears throat> they said, you have to come up with an alternate title. And so that's the name of the song in England, is Alternate Time. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm over there, I introduce the song, and here's Alternate Time. <laughs> and then I find out, and, but I did, I asked why. Why, um, what's wrong with that? I was on television, on BBC TV, you know, at 7 o'clock at night. And they, and they told me it actually means a horny Liverpudlian putz. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a prolific writer. Uh, you know, I didn't write that many. I still don't write that many tunes. <clears throat> but obviously, it was the only monkey written song that actually became top ten. And it was kept out of number one by the friggin' Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> I think Strawberry Fields or something kept it out of number one. But that's not bad, bad company to be in. <laughs> So I know that you were the voice of Arthur for the first season of The Tick, and you never went to do Paul Paulson got the second season. I was wondering why you uh, didn't do that, and that leads into my next question is, um, do you consider yourself an actor that played music or a musician that became an actor? Great question, both of them. Um, yes, I did the first season, loved the show, had a great time, but in voiceovers, they don't contract you for much past the episode you're doing. It isn't like, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just so unused to being up this early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and 
don't even have these hours on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> they don't exist. It's just blank space here for early morning. Um, but they don't contract. It's almost like a day job. And I, I was contracted to do those first episodes. And before they decided to pick up the series in the end of the show, I got a tour. I was booked on a tour. And I booked the tour, and then my agent calls and said, they want another series. They want the second season. And I said, sorry, I can't. And I was very disappointed, actually. That happened to me a couple of times uh, over the years doing it, those animated shows. And I said, you know, I'm sorry, I can't. And now I've got this tour, and I can't contract to do these shows. Um, Sorry, your second question. Oh. Um, I don't know. You could probably answer that better than I. But you, <laughs> you just, the thing is, um, if you understand the genetics of the monkeys, you know the show called Glee. That is probably the closest thing or one of the things that's come along. It's a show about an imaginary Glee club. But they can all sing and dance and act and, and do it all and play. The closest thing is comparing it to something on Broadway. You know, The Monkees was a musical. It was a little half hour Marx Brothers musical on television. So what would you consider Harpo Marx or Groucho Marx? Are they actors that can sing and play? Are they musicians that can act? I mean, it's more of an entertainer you're an entertainer, more old school, like a Danny Kay or like a, uh, a Donald Connor that can sing and play and tap dance and act and do jokes. And, you know, that's more accurate, I would think. I, my, my, um, my first job was in the business was as service boy uh, in the 50s. Um, that was the first paying gig, if I remember correctly. I had some prenatal, I have some prenatal work coming out on ultrasound. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the fetal position. <laughs> um, we're getting tragic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was just an ad, but even then I was singing, uh, I sang on the, on the show, the theme song. And then I, I started playing classical guitar, Spanish guitar. My father got me into that. And then, you know, when I was 10 or 12, something like that. And uh, I went on the road when we were uh, pitching, uh, not pitching, um, on a press junket for Circus Boy. Um, we, we got on a train, my father and I, and the elephant. <laughs> and we took the train. Obviously, you can't fly with an elephant. But, uh, they get very uh, innocent. <laughs> um, and, and the bark bag is huge. We don't want to see it all the bar. <laughs> um, so we did this train across the country. And one of the first stops in this press junket for Circus Boy was uh, Pittsburgh. And it was a place called Kennywood Park. And they asked me, can you sing any songs? And I could play guitar at the time a little bit. I worked up like two or three songs. Uh, I'm going to sit right now and write myself a letter and purple people leader and, or, or something. And, uh, and do it. So I get out on the bandstand with my little guitar, and there's two or three musicians behind me, and I sing uh, these little songs. And then they bring out the elephant. The elephant does like uh, 15, 20 minutes of. <laughs> So basically, my first gig was opening for an <laughs> <laughs> um, But I, that, that's when I learned to my first musical instrument. And then uh, I would take my guitar to parties in junior high school and high school and play Segovia or Villalobos or something like that. And uh, now I'm in uh, as a 10 or 12 year old. You're by now 14 maybe. And the girls said, and the girls would say, do you know any Kingston Trio? And I'm like, I'll be right back. <laughs> and I went to learn Tom Dooley and I started playing folk music. And played folk music for a few years, even sang with my sister and some friends locally, doing uh, Peter 
Paul and Mary in the early 60s folk stuff. And then um, that morphed into rock and roll, and I had a, a couple of rock and roll cover bands. My audition piece for the Monkees was uh, Johnny Good. Hmm. Hi, Mickey. I'm Sean Simmons from Peoria, Illinois. Um, congratulations on having a wonderful new album with the Good Times hey. album. <laughs> and with the great critical and um, success of that album, has there been any talk of maybe a follow-up between you three? Yeah, of course, but that kind of scares me. You know, what do you do to, you know, to follow that? It's always a problem. So, yeah, right. but that hasn't been talked yet. Good. <laughs> no, no, no songs, no recording dates, no nothing. Oh, I'll be looking forward to it. <laughs> well, we're on tour, Peter. Uh, we're on tour until we're to do it. How much did this show was scripted, and how much was just some guys having fun? Because you always seem to have such a good rapport together, and it seemed like you were really friends. Yeah. So, uh, how much of that was some improv, and how much was scripted? <coughs> That's a very good question. Um, and the producers were obviously had in mind that they wanted a sort of spontaneous, spontaneous sort of feel. But when you only have three days to shoot a show, and they all had a little plot, a bad guy and a good guy and a girl that fell in love with Davey and, 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 and <laughs> <laughs> end up with a chase and saving the day. Um, I still have the pilot script, which I read for, when I read for the audition. I have the pilot script, and by the way, um, who asked, oh, that gentleman, um, the original spelling was regular, monkeys, hmm. M-O-N-K-E-Y-S, and that's what it says on the pilot script, but some business affairs person at Screen Gems must have said, you'll never be able to copyright this, you'll never be able to trademark it, so you got to change the spelling, and it became monkeys so they could uh, copyright it. Um, but on the pilot script, of course, it isn't Mickey, David, David, Peter, and Mike. It's Biff, Joe, Frank, and <laughs> Charlie, because uh, they had the castings. Um, no, it was definitely a scripted show, a, a, a scripted. But even in the audition process, they were heavily encouraging us to Im to do improv. And there were interviews that you've probably seen, and there were shtick back and forth, and then the screen tests where. We were encouraged to improvise, even though I wasn't familiar with improvisation that much. I, it, it made me very uncomfortable. I was used to a script, and I would learn my lines at night, and I'd show up the next day, and I do. And that was more typical, and still is in many, in, in many instances. But back then, it was you did not improvise. You did not ad lib. That was a big no-no. You know. If you read the lines as they were written, and um, but right, like I said, right from the get-go, they were like really. Uh, in fact, after we uh, sold the pilot, they hired this guy named Jim Frawley, who eventually ended up directing many of the episodes. But at the time, he was a guy, uh, a, a improv guy out of Second City with, uh, with uh, uh, Mike Nichols and Elaine May. You know, and they hired him to teach us improv. And we did all those little exercises, you know, throwing the ball around and <clears throat> taking a theme and a, and a couple of words in front. And so they clearly had in mind that they wanted that sort of sensibility. And we, uh, um, you know, it's amazing, we absolutely clicked in that uh, sense immediately. And I think that's one of the reasons they probably cast us, you know, because when they did the screen test, I remember doing scenes with Davey. I, I remember Davey the best, I think, because we had a lot in common, being child stars. I'd actually, I actually don't remember Mike and Peter uh, well at all from those early screen tests. But one day they just introduced us, and I have no idea why they picked the four of us. I don't know if anybody does, but, uh, but I think a lot of it had to do with that chemistry. <laughs> but my question is, well, my father started watching you when you were on Circus Boy, and we used to take these long road trips, and it was always the monkeys that we were listening to. 
and we bonded over songs like we loved uh, Sometime in the Morning and Shades of Grey, songs like that. Are there any specific songs that you and your daughters bonded over? That of I, yours. The what? Are there any songs of yours that you and your daughters kind of bond over or that they really enjoy? Oh. Um, uh, wow, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've never, in my family, I've never been a big music listener. I think because <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> kind of a busman's holiday, you know, so when I listen to music and over the years, um, like right now, when we get up in the morning, my wife and I put on classical guitar music, Segovia, <laughs> and in the afternoon at martini time, we put on Frank Sinatra. <laughs> um, but my daughters, um, you know, they, they all had their own kind of music at the time. I used to, I have a daughter named Georgia, and I used to sing Georgia about Ray Charles song Georgia. She hated it. Hi Mickey. Um one sorry for crying on you yesterday. Just, just saying. Two, um how often do you get recognized in public? Well it depends where I am. If I'm just at home at the at the mall. Uh, very seldom, but in LA, of course, people are so used to seeing them. Um, it depends if, if I'm working somewhere, like I'm here doing this, and people know about it. And so, yes, I, I, I tend to get recognized. Or it depends, you know, if the show is showing, or it depends if I have a concert in town, then, yeah, more often than not. Uh, I just wanted to say, when I was a young girl, we were living in Hawaii, and I had my dad made a special tape, and it was monkeys. And I'd ask to play that tape all the time. It's real to real, <laughs> and loved it. But I wanted to know, did you all do any gay gags while you were filming the monkeys? Any what? Any gags? G gags? Pranks. Sorry. Pranks. Oh, pranks, tricks. I mean, while well, doing the show. Well, the whole friggin' show was a gag. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, that speaks back to what I was saying earlier. They had encouraged us to have this era of, of spontaneity. Now, uh, and that's where you, we, you get a lot of that stuff that it, it appears to be ad-libbed on the show, and it, well, it was. It was ad-libbed. And they often would use that stuff uh, in the final edit. They, they wanted that. And so we were encouraged to improvise and add it. It, it. it got ugly sometimes, because when you do that, of course, 22-year-old guys, and you encourage them to, you know, get it, go out there. Uh, it's like, I, I kind of compare it to a nuclear uh, reaction, like a fission reaction. Um, I don't know if you, if you know what a fission is. It's a, a nuclear process with a, a, a power plants, right? But it's dangerous because you got to contain it. And if you don't and it escapes, it, like Fukushima, it burns a hole through the center of the earth. <laughs> but if you contain it, you can get a lot of energy out of it. And so I remember it being a little bit like that. It would be like we'd be in our dressing rooms and they'd set up the set and set up the scene and we'd rehearse the scene. And then somebody would go, okay, here they come. <laughs> and we'd come out and sometimes literally bouncing off the walls, just flipping out. And it was great when it was just the four of us, but sometimes, it was a couple times they had to shut down the set. The director said, I can't handle it anymore, I can't. <laughs> or other old school actors would get very frustrated because they were like, read the lines and do the scene. Um, so it was all about gags and sometimes I, I think back, it got out of hand. We were out of line, totally out of line. But we were encouraged to do it. <laughs> so the directors and producers had this very interesting, you know, uh, challenge to not uh, compress it, uh, contain it so much that the fire goes out, but not let it get so big that it burns a hole through the center of the earth. <laughs> Question. <laughs> Mr. Schneider, the dummy on the show. Oh, what yeah. happened to him? 
You know, I have no idea. Probably after the show went off the air, it would have gone back into the prop department and uh, some some other show would have used it. I have no idea. Huh. Speaking of the show, Mickey, over the years we've often heard that had there been a third season of the series, that the format would have been vastly different. If that's true, what would the format have been like? And then also, what was your fondest memory of touring with Jimi Hendrix? Um, <clears throat> well, let me see, I'll answer the second one first. Um, I think sitting in, in the hotel room, I have pictures of this, sitting in the hotel room just jamming on guitars, he was a very, you know, very, very different than the persona that he had on stage. He was very quiet, very shy, quite naive, you know, he was just a year older than I was, you know, 22, 23 years old. And just sitting around um, a plane uh, in, in the hotel rooms, probably that's one of my fondest memories. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, the first question was... First question was, we've often heard over the years that had there been a third oh, season in the Monkey series, what would the format have been like? Well, at, at, during the second se the season, <clears throat> they approached us and said, uh, what about a third series? We just got off, got off the road, you know, on tour, and we were hanging with the Beatles and stuff, and it was, it was kind of weird and, and, and difficult to go back to a, a, tip, a, a straight production schedule, eight o'clock in the morning, you know, on the set and makeup and wardrobe. And also, I, I don't know, there was maybe the general just kind of sensibility, the feeling that we've done this, we've been there, done this, we've done all, you know, episodes of essentially the same format. And I vaguely remember discussing the kind of show we might, you know, uh, want to do. It would have been much more freeform and sketch-oriented maybe, and um, probably, I don't, nothing ever very specific was written or, or done, but it probably would have ended up like what laughing became. Uh, and um, that kind of, I don't know what you call that, sketch, comedy, freeform, you know, kind of show. Um, but it didn't happen. We, the, the show was canceled, and we went on our merry, well, we did the movie, the, the movie head. But I think that, uh, that, that's probably where it was going, some direction like that. Hello, Mickey. Uh, my question is about, actually about Ted. Can you tell us a little bit about the production of that, what it was like to work with Jack uh, Nicholson uh, on that project? Well, um, at one point, somewhere there, uh, to, in, during the second season, they came to us and they said, uh, we have an opportunity to make a movie. And uh, what do we want to do? So we sat around and talked about it. And, uh, the general consensus, I remember, was we have an opportunity to stretch it a little bit here. Uh, we can do topics and things that we aren't normally, well, not at all allowed to do on the, on the TV show because of uh, standards and practices at the time, the censorship. Not that that's what the month was about anyway, but, you know. <coughs> uh, and the general consensus was we don't want to do a 90-minute version of one of the TV episodes. In retrospect, of course, we should have probably, uh, because it had been much more successful. But on the other hand, we would not have that wonderful movie called Head. So it, you know, it's a toss-up. Um, I'm very proud of the work I did in that movie. You know, I still don't know what it's about. But, <laughs> um, uh, I do. <laughs> So that was the idea, and then Bob Rapinson brought on the set one day this young B-movie actor called uh, Jack Nicholson. And he said, this is a guy that's gonna, I'd like to get involved to, 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 to craft and write this movie. And he was, he was and still is, you know, just such an incredibly funny, charismatic, wonderful guy. And we all fell in love with him, and he, would, he spent months with each of us individually and all together and came on the road. And, <clears throat> and then we all went to uh, a, a, a golf spa place out in California for a weekend. And we all sat around the tape recorder, and I had film footage of this, uh, and just talking about the movie and what we wanted to do and what we didn't want to do, and, and uh, just chatting and talking. And they took away, uh, Jack and Bob took away those tapes and uh, all the conversations and the experience. And, 
and Jack uh, 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 penned that, uh, that, that script. That's basically how it happened. Hi, uh, I've got a question about the song, Daydream Believer. Is that about a uh, young couple and is uh, Jean the person's wife? Is she brought the Daydream Believer and the home kind of queen? I have no idea. <laughs> I, uh, uh, after, I was asked that question, but by then John Stewart had passed away. And so I, I, you know, you, you guys probably know more about it than I do. <laughs> Anybody know what that song is about? <laughs> I don't know, no clue. Okay, we've got time for one last question. How did it feel when you, when you guys first found out that you would be on TV? I, I, I How did it feel when you guys first learned that you'd be on television? Well, I'd already been on television. Um, I had uh, had a series when I was a kid called Surface Boy. So I'd already had a series. This was my second series. And so I knew exactly what, what it was all about. And I'd had a fan club, and I'd done parades, and had autograph sessions, and all that. So by the time the monkeys came along, I'd already been in the business uh, 10 years. Uh, so for me, it wasn't a, a new experience. Uh, David had been on Broadway and done some TV appearances, and he'd been on a Coronation Street series in England. So he was used to it. My computer has never done any uh, television, so they, they probably had a very different, you know, outlook about it. And uh, I remember Mike telling me, he said, I had no idea what to do, I just followed you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, guys, well, give it up. Ah,